In December, the Supreme Court will hear oral argument in Collins v. Mnuchin, a challenge to the structure of the Federal Housing Finance Authority. Though it's an executive branch agency, Congress limited the president's ability to control this agency by giving the director a five-year term and allowing removal only for cause by the president. In other words, Congress has restricted the president's ability to say, you're fired. The Supreme Court first blessed this tactic of protecting agency officials from political accountability in the 1935 case Humphrey's Executor versus United States, which involved the Federal Trade Commission. But in recent years, the court has become increasingly skeptical of Congress's attempts to insulate agency officials from presidential control. Over the years, the court has heard many challenges to these sorts of tenure protections. The most famous case didn't involve an administrative agency. It challenged the creation of an independent counsel who was authorized to investigate and prosecute executive branch officials for certain criminal offenses. And in 1988, the Supreme Court upheld that law, but a single justice's dissenting opinion would ultimately overshadow the majority. I'm Elizabeth Slattery. And I'm Anastasia Bowden. And this week on DIST, we're looking at Morrison versus Olson. The court's decision is indefensible. I respectfully dissent. Because the majority in this case has not done what a court of law must do, I respectfully dissent. For these reasons and others elaborated in my opinion, I respectfully dissent. We respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I dissent. Around the turn of the 20th century, progressives set out to create a bold new government, one where administration of the law would be separate from the influence of politics. In this new administrative state, apolitical expert administrators would be free to come up with solutions for all our public policy problems and not have to bother with being accountable to anyone. Fast forward to the present, and now there are more than 450 federal agencies that churn out scores of regulations each year, dwarfing the number of statutes enacted by Congress. On average, that's 27 regulations for every one law. Agencies regulate everything from highways to healthcare poking into every nook and cranny of daily life, as Chief Justice John Roberts has put it. And all the while, agencies enjoy limited oversight from Congress, the president, and the courts. Speaking of oversight, you might be wondering, what does the Constitution have to say about the president's ability to control agencies? You're fired. Article 2 of the Constitution vests the executive power in the president, along with the duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. The president is just one man or woman. So naturally, he or she may enlist the assistance of others to carry out these duties. The Constitution details the process for appointing executive branch officials, but it doesn't explicitly address how to remove them. So let's take a quick walk through history to see how removal has been viewed. Back in 1789, when Congress was setting up the first executive departments, it debated this very issue. We talked with some experts about this. Here's what one had to say. I'm Sai Krishna Prakash. I'm a professor of law and Miller Center Senior Fellow at the University of Virginia. The decision of 1789 refers to an extraordinarily long series of debates over months about whether the president could remove the cabinet secretaries. And initially, uh, the statutes creating the cabinet secretaries, the Department of War, now the Department of Defense, the Department of Foreign Affairs, now the Department of State, and then finally the Department of Treasury, By enacting these statutes, which assumed that the president had constitutional authority to remove, uh, the members of Congress who proposed that language wanted to make it clear that that Congress thought that the Constitution already granted the president that authority. And ever since then, presidents have removed individuals from office where uh, statutes don't grant them the authority. That is to say, statutes may be silent on whether the president can remove. Presidents have removed nonetheless because of this so-called decision of 1789. And Congress recognized that the president must be able to control his subordinates. In other words, you're fired. In a letter to Thomas Jefferson, James Madison summed up the first Congress's conclusion. Since the removal power was not expressly taken away in the Constitution, it remained with the president. It would be a long time before the Supreme Court had an opportunity to weigh in on this matter. Not until 1926 in Myers versus United States. Here's Sai Prakash again. Myers is a case about a postmaster. And by statute, Congress had provided that the Senate needed to concur in the removal of a postmaster. 
so for about 75 years or so, presidents were removing without any Senate involvement and without requiring any cause. They just, they, they thought they had constitutional authority and Congress didn't really limit it. And then along came the Reconstruction Congress and they started posing limits on the president's power to remove. And the postmaster statutes are one of these statutes. This dispute over a postmaster went all the way to the Supreme Court. Chief Justice William Howard Taft wrote the decision recognizing that removal was the president's power alone and one that was essential to the president's ability to carry out the laws. So basically, you fired. Here's Sai again. Chief Justice Taft was the only person to serve as president and, and chief justice, and he probably had a, an acute sense that the president can't take care that the laws are faithfully executed or oversee the bureaucracy if individuals can't be fired at his pleasure. And of course, if they can't be fired without the Senate's consent, it makes it very difficult for the president to control the bureaucracy. Taft's personal experience almost certainly informed his ruling in Myers. Here's an administrative law expert. I'm Adam White. I'm a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, part of the new program on social, cultural, and constitutional studies. And I'm also an assistant professor of law at George Mason University's Scalia Law School, where I run the C. Boyd and Gray Center for the study of the administrative state. So much of what's in there I take as a reflection of his now forgotten, but at the time very controversial friction with uh, Gifford Pinchot, who ran uh, the Forest Service with whom uh, there was an open feud between Pinchot, who had come from the earlier Roosevelt administration, feuding with the Taft administration, and Taft ultimately having to send Pinchot packing. Um, When you read Chief Justice Taft's opinion in Myers, you see that he's been through, as president, the challenges of running the executive branch and executing the laws as he, the president, um, sees uh, as, as a best execution of the office itself. Less than 10 years later, the Supreme Court changed course in a case called Humphrey's Executor versus United States. The case asked whether Congress could limit the president's removal of commissioners of the Federal Trade Commission. Congress said they could only be removed for inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance. The court's theory was that the FTC didn't exercise executive power. It was this newfangled, quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial, independent agency. So the president didn't need to have complete control over its commissioners. In fact, the court said it was necessary to protect the FTC from the coercive influence of the president. This was at the height of the conflict between the Supreme Court and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a conflict that would ultimately culminate in FDR's unsuccessful attempt to pack the court. Robert Jackson, who would later become a Supreme Court justice, but at the time was serving in the Roosevelt administration, said FDR believed the court went out of its way to spite him personally with its decision in Humphrey's executor. Here's Sai Prakash. It was issued on a day where other opinions were issued unanimously against the executive branch. And I think what was going on was a concern that um, Roosevelt was gathering power into his hands in a way that looked ominous in light of what was going on in Europe, both in fascist countries and communist countries. And they, they wanted to make it clear that, you know, we weren't, they weren't going to tolerate that kind of concentration of power in the, in the executive. The constitution actually grants the president, I think, a power to remove and, you know, Congress can't limit that. And so it doesn't really matter that uh, there are these uh, sort of ominous, you know, dark clouds on the horizon that might've moved the court. But I, I think you're exactly right that they were, they were trying to you know, signal that they weren't going to stand idly by as Roosevelt uh, accreted powers into his own hands. The ruling was a turning point for the administrative state. Here's Sai again. I think you know, it's, a, it's a product of its time, but it's had tremendous legs because, of course, the entire administrative state that we have today is built upon Humphrey's executor and its view that these independent these indep- these agencies are meant to be independent. The president can't remove except for cause. So Congress created more and more agencies, eventually reaching the point where President Harry Truman exclaimed, I thought I was the president, but when it comes to these bureaucrats, I can't do a damn thing. So the president can't just say, You're fired. You're fired.
And that brings us to Morrison versus Olson. Congress passed the Ethics in Government Act in 1978, setting up a system where a special court could appoint an independent counsel who in turn was authorized to investigate and prosecute government officials for certain criminal offenses. The attorney general could fire the independent counsel, but only for cause. Adam White provides some important context. It is important when we think about the independent counsel statute to put it in the context of the 1970s. It is understandable that in the aftermath of Watergate, Congress and the people that elected that Congress would want to create these auxiliary measures of accountability in and around the executive branch. The 1970s was full of these statutes. The independent counsel statute, the War Powers Act, the Emergency Powers Act, FISA. And I do think it's understandable to why that whole suite of laws would have been enacted in the 70s. There's like the, there's the good faith reasons, and there's just also the cynical reasons that Congress saw an opportunity to really assert itself over a weak president for the first time in, oh, since before FDR, really. So what happened in Morrison? Here's Adam again. Congress didn't like what the Reagan Environmental Protection Agency was doing. Congress tried to get information from the executive branch, subpoenaing it, holding hearings. And Ted Olson advises the president, advises the executive branch. And later when he testifies before Congress, Congress is dissatisfied with that testimony, thinks he might have perjured himself. And so they bring this special counsel investigation down upon Ted Olson by wielding their power over the, the attorney general, their political power. It's not just like a dispute within the executive branch between the special, the independent counsel and Ted Olson. This is about the relative powers of Congress and the president. Olson sued, arguing that the Office of Independent Counsel was unconstitutional because it limited the power of the attorney general to remove the independent counsel. The case reached the Supreme Court in the spring of 1988. We'll hear arguments now in number 87-1279, Alexia Morrison versus Theodore B. Olson. Justice Anthony Kennedy, who had been confirmed two months earlier, recused himself. And to this day, we don't know for certain why. But a report in the New York Times suggested it may have been because the case involved an investigation of high-ranking Reagan administration officials. And of course, Kennedy had just been appointed by President Reagan. The decision dropped on June 27, 1988. Chief Justice William Rehnquist wrote for a 7-1 majority. Here's Rehnquist with the opinion. Uh, the second of the two cases is number 87, 1279, Morrison against Olson. This case involves a challenge to the constitutionality of the independent counsel provisions of the Ethics in Government Act. We now reverse the Court of Appeals in an opinion joined by seven members of the court and uphold the validity of the independent counsel provision of the Ethics in Government Act. We conclude that the act does not violate the separation of powers principles embedded in the Constitution by impermissibly interfering with the executive's discharge of his function as allocated by the Constitution. The Constitution, we hold, does not prevent Congress from restricting the Attorney General's power to fire an independent counsel to those situations in which good cause is shown. But we do not think that in this case the good cause removal restriction contained in the act unduly interferes with the president's exercise of executive power and his constitutional duty to ensure that the laws are faithfully executed. Justice Scalia disagreed. I'm the one of the eight who filed the dissent in this case. And I, I suppose when one dissents from as many of the court's decisions in one day as I have today, you get to uh, discuss it. I discuss it because I think it's uh, one of the most important opinions the court has issued in many years. To many people, it may seem that this case is of some political interest, <clears throat> but is not likely <clears throat> now or in the future to have any proximate effect upon their lives or the lives of their children. It does not, after all, involve freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, or any of the wonderful guarantees of our Bill of Rights. That is wrong. In the dictatorships of the modern world, bills of rights are a dime a dozen. What makes ours work is a governmental structure. That structure was designed to prevent an excess of governmental power, which is always the first threat to liberty, from coalescing. To achieve that, two principles were absolutely central. One was the separation of powers among three branches. The second 
was an equilibration of powers, so that none of the three branches could become too strong. Article 2, Section 1 provides that the executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States. The Court's opinion today does not deny that what is at issue in this case is purely executive power, quintessentially executive power, the power to prosecute for violations of the law. Yet it holds that, despite the Constitution, a statute can enable this power to be exercised by someone who is not entirely subject to the control of the President a mini-executive, so to speak, with jurisdiction over a very small, although in my view, a very important area. But more fundamentally, it does not seem relevant to me, as it does to the court, how important the particular element of executive power taken away from the president may be. Even if we were good at assessing that, which today's opinion convinces me we are not, the Constitution did not leave the president's powers at our mercy. It says that the executive power, not some executive power, shall be vested in a President of the United States, not a President of the United States and others. I do not think we are qualified to decide that. More importantly, I do not think we are authorized to decide that. We talked with several people about Justice Scalia's dissent. Here's Ed Whalen, a former Scalia clerk and editor of three books collecting the justices' speeches, opinions, and other writings. Uh, his uh, solo dissent at the end of what was only his second term on the court, but I think um, arguably it was the first clear sign of what a great justice he would be. And I remember this passage when I read it because it made everything click in my mind. Aha, now I understand. He addresses the majority's argument that most important among the executive branch's controls over the independent counsel is the attorney general's power to remove the counsel for good cause. As he puts it, this is somewhat like referring to shackles as an effective means of locomotion. And that image conveys the the essential point that the baseline ought to be no limits uh, on removal. uh, And that, as he puts it a sentence later, limiting removal power to good cause is an impediment to not an effective grant of presidential control. And here's Adam White. It's sort of the best of all worlds in terms of what you would want from an opinion. It argues from first principles, but it also argues in the context of factual reality. It's not just an abstract theoretical, uh, an abstract theory of the presidency. It, it, It has theory and it has first principles starting with the founders, but it takes seriously the context in which the case arose. And here's Sai Prakash. Scalia's opinion is partly purely constitutional, just saying the president has the executive power, Congress can't diminish it full stop. That's what they're doing by passing this act. But then he pivoted and talked about the consequences of giving an unlimited budget to an independent counsel who would then predictably try to find wrongdoing in order to justify their investigation. I can remember the first time I read Morrison. It was before I started law school, but I'd been working around lawyers for a while. I remember one of them making a joke about this wolf comes as a wolf, and I didn't get it. He said, you know, this wolf comes as a wolf. This is no, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing. This wolf comes as a wolf. This wolf comes as a wolf. This wolf comes as a wolf. This This wolf wolf comes comes as a wolf. wolf. His point was, this is a naked attempt on the part of Congress to make it more difficult for the president to function as an, as a chief executive, right? It's meant to ensnare him in investigations, um, long investigations, um, where all the incentives of this, of the special, of the independent prosecutor are to find wrongdoing on the part of the president and his associates. Um, and so I think, you know, this is a powerful dissent. After reading the dissent, I was surprised the case came out the way it did that Rehnquist wrote the majority, with Scalia dissenting. It's not the ideological breakdown you might expect in a case dealing with executive power. Here's Adam White. Morrison is, is, a, is a fascinating case and a fun case to teach. And I always point out to my students from the very outset that this isn't one of those sort of familiar fights between the conservative justices and the liberal justices. Here it's, it's Rehnquist for the majority, Scalia for the dissent. And it's not just that they were both conservatives, right? They both had worked in the executive branch. They both had run the office of legal counsel. Um, they agreed on so much, yet they disagree so profoundly in this case. What it really comes down to, in Scalia's opinion, 
is power. Here's Sai. And I think what was going on in the case is the court majority thought that there was some need to have someone independent of the executive branch investigate the president's close associates and friends, and of course the president and him or herself. And so they thought this was a, a sort of reasonable accommodation of the separation of powers to ground uh, realities. But the chief never really explained how it would be consistent with the grant of executive power to uh, allow this to bless or sanctify this statute as constitutional because the way the way to think about it is they carved out part of the executive power and granted it to the you know the the independent council and they said well this isn't so bad and of course you know if you just take sort of you know ten feet of someone's property well what's the big deal you still have a lot of property but there's no stopping point right because it's not obvious why this particular sort of power grab is constitutional, but the next one is not. And if you look at all of them in isolation, well, they all look small, but if you look at them um, together, then it starts looking kind of big. Um, and so they, you know, they just sort of, as you said, they, they pivoted from the fact that the, uh, the independent council was a quintessentially executive officer akin to a, to a postmaster and said, well, we no longer think that executive and non-executive officers is the dividing point. Instead, we're just going to ask whether this is so central to the executive branch's functioning. Although, you know, the the power to prosecute crimes seems uh, pretty essential to me, to the executive power. Yeah, what they would say, I think, is, well, the, the Department of Justice still has plenty of power to prosecute crimes, right? This is just taking over a small uh, sliver of it. Um, just a little slice. Yeah. And Adam points out, the case isn't really about the independent counsel versus the president. Just because Congress didn't claim power for itself doesn't mean that Congress taking power away from the president isn't itself empowering the other parts of government. That's what what Scalia recognizes. And so he brings this back to not just a dispute between the, the executive branch and the independent counsel, but the executive branch and Congress. With time, Justice Scalia's dissent would come to overshadow the majority opinion. Here's SCOTUS advocate Lisa Blatt. The most impactful dissent, I think, and maybe this is because of the class I teach, but even before then, it was Morrison versus Olson. I kind of grew up thinking that was the law. Like, nobody ever read the decision. Everyone just read the dissent. And I don't think of any other case where I never thought of the majority opinion as not the law, but I thought, no, the dissent. And I think, I'm I'm pretty sure... I'm not sure how many people signed his dissent, but the fact that everyone thought that Justice Scalia's view of the world was correct is truly remarkable. So yeah, that that one probably is definitely still the most impactful dissent I can think of. Ultimately, Scalia's view became the law. Congress let the independent counsel statute expire in 1999, and the Clinton administration adopted regulations authorizing the attorney general to appoint and supervise a special counsel, while still retaining some degree of independence. And as Sai Prakash points out, Many people thought that Justice Scalia was right and um, that the majority was wrong. That, I think, view has become more pronounced over time. Um, Although the reasons for that view may not be his dissent as as much as what happened afterwards, which is the investigation of Bill Clinton, right? A lot of people who thought he was wrong thought better of the opinion after Ken Starr was appointed to investigate Bill Clinton, Whitewater, and then Monica Lewinsky. Adam White agrees. By the time we get to the 1990s, the proof is is increasingly in the pudding. If it wasn't clear in 1988 when Morrison v. Olson decided was headed in a bad direction, it was a bipartisan agreement by the end of 1999 um, in the the midst of the the Whitewater investigations, Ken Starr and, and all that leading to impeachment, where all of this could go. Ken Starr himself has said um, since then that, that he could see firsthand why the Independent Counsel Office was a troubling office. But the debate continues over who controls agencies and when the president can tell agency bureaucrats. You're all fired. And in recent years, the Supreme Court has heard a number of cases on this issue such as? We'll hear argument first this morning in case 08861, 
Free Enterprise Fund and Beckstead and Watts versus the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Challenging purported dual-level removal protections. And? We'll hear argument first this morning, Case 17130, Lucia versus the Securities and Exchange Commission. Asking how administrative law judges are to be constitutionally appointed and removed. And? We'll hear argument first this morning in case 19-7, CELA Law versus the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Asking whether having a solo agency head who may only be removed for cause violates the Constitution. And this December, the court will hear Collins versus Mnuchin, yet another challenge to an agency Congress protected from presidential control. Raising the question yet again, is the president really in charge? I love this phrase that Chief Justice Roberts used. I think it's from the um, PCAOB case, the cajoler in chief. And is that what the the chief magistrate has been reduced to? Uh, He can't directly control uh, these independent agencies. And so he's left to cajole. What, What do you think of that? That is a great line. I think there's a lot to be said for that. At the end of the day, the president has this duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed he has this duty to faithfully execute his office. He swear, that's his oath. And then to say he'll accomplish that by just saying pretty please over and over again to bureaucrats like three levels down the food chain, that's, that's, that's no way to run a country. I, I think it, it sort of it, it belittles the office of the presidency. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not for presidential micromanagement of every single thing in, in executive branch. At the end of the day, the president needs to have control over these things. And so ultimately, we have to trust that the elected president will do the right thing. And if he doesn't, he gets voted out. We have to give him the real power to actually execute. And as, as, as you pointed out, just reducing him to sort of the mother may I president, where he's, he's asking the people who work for, under him for their permission um, to do the right thing is, is just flips our constitutional system upside down. So what will happen with this latest challenge? Will the court say the buck stops with the president? Or will it reduce the president to cajoler in chief? Thanks for listening to DIST. Please subscribe on Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd appreciate your feedback, so send questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes to dist at pacificlegal.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and tell your friends to check out DIST. In the words of our incumbent, you're fired. <laughs> We're all originalists now, right? We're, so I say. I mean, I guess what I'd say is, you know, this is my advice to the justices. They're not listening, perhaps, but. <laughs> hey, maybe they will. <laughs> maybe they will. When you're a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. <laughs> yeah, when you're, when, you're, when you're a hammer and there's only one nail to hammer away at, you'll just keep hammering away at that nail, too. With an unlimited budget. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. That's right. An unlimited number of swings. You're fired. <laughs> <clears throat> Gosh, I'm getting really... <clears throat> COVID. Just kidding. Dry- oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Uh, it wouldn't show up this soon. Um, okay. It's funny how you start like thinking in podcasts now. Like when you said oops, and I'm like, insert clip of oops, I did it. <laughs> think like a podcast. Sorry, I was stressing over if I said Mnuchin, right? It's like one of those things <laughs> where it's like Brett Favre, you know, Kim Basinger, Basinger. Um, okay. GIF, GIF. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Get ready. We need jock jams. Yeah, I was just thinking. Da 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 da. Jock jams. Yep. Y'all ready for this? You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. You also are fired. You're 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 both fired. You're fired.